Good morning. Hi. I haven't seen you guys in a long time. How are you? Are we all good? You look lovely. You haven't changed one bit. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Lindsay Rasher. My husband and I were faithful attendees here for quite some time, and we moved and found a church a little closer to home. But I am here today to uh, spend some time worshiping in his presence, and I would love it if he would join me. So could you please stand this morning? I'm going to need some help, so you got to help me sing today, okay?
one thing I hope you know before you leave here today, that you are welcome here in this place. We're going to welcome the Lord together this morning as we sing. spirit right now in this room. Man, if I could have stopped the song in the middle and started preaching, I think I might have. How many here, I'm going to try not to cry. How many here have been in the waiting? I've been in the waiting. I'm in the waiting right now. Here's the deal. When you're in the waiting, it's your choice what you do. You can choose to praise. You can choose to get up off the ground, stand up and say, God, you are bigger than this. That's what you can choose to do. I think you could probably figure out the other side of that, right? But today, 
in my waiting, in my miracle that I wait for, I choose to praise. So maybe you're not in the waiting, but I bet you know somebody who is. Surround them with your love. You don't know what they're going through. Tell them you love them. Help them praise in their storm. Lift up their hands for them if they can't do it. Because if we don't praise our God, the rocks will cry out for us. And remember how good of a God that we serve. And remember the storms that he brought you through before and where you are now. Remember his goodness. Never forget his goodness. Oh 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Has God been good to you? Has God been good to you? He's provided your needs. He's taken care of you. Then with all you have, with all the strength you have, just worship Him and let Him know. Don't just put your hands together. Also open your mouth and voice your praise. I think sometimes we've allowed the voice of our praise to be taken away. And we just started clapping our hands. But we should also voice that He is a good, good Father. That He is great and magnificent. That He is transcendent above all things. He, is, he has knowledge over all things. And that He is worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. He is a good, good, good Father. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. As you can tell, I am not well. Gift from Texas, I guess. <laughs> uh, it is not COVID, by the way. I did test. But uh, I think just General Assembly is just a marathon of one thing after another and very, very busy week. And then plus in San Antonio, we finally had some good weather. It's about 102 every day. And going from that to air conditioning, from that to air conditioning all day long, I think just got me sick. But uh, hopefully I can get through this today. We do want to pray for those in our church who are ill. Again, always remember Sister Sharon. But anyone else who's struggling with any kind of sickness, just keep them in prayer. And also remember that one person in your life who you'd like to see saved more than all others. You just really want to see them come to God. Don't ever stop praying. There are so many people in this room who are a testimony of how someone prayed for them. They never, ever stop, no matter how bad it looked, no matter how maybe out in the world that person went, they just kept praying and kept praying and kept praying. I know I am a testimony of my parents and my grandparents. They just, no matter how bad it looked, they never gave up. So don't stop praying. Don't, don't ever come to a point where you think they can't be reached. No one is outside the grace of God. No one cannot be touched by His grace. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you are and all that you do. We thank you that you are a good God. That there are no words that we have in our language to properly, properly describe your goodness and your greatness and your mercy and your grace. And we just, God, we just call upon you for those in our family, in our church family who are ill. We pray for Sister Sharon for a divine touch from heaven upon her body. We pray for others who are struggling with illness. But we also, Lord God, we pray for those who are outside the church, those who do not know you, those who are in darkness and they are lost. For they suffer the greatest disease mankind has ever experienced, and that is the disease of sin. And we just pray that somehow, in some way, through whatever means you choose, you will draw them to yourself. Save their soul and bring them into your kingdom to be used by you, to be loved by you, to have that peace and joy and that abundant life that you promise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We're going to continue our worship in uh, tithes and offerings. But before we do that, I want to tell just a little bit of a story that I heard recently. There was this guy, and he was a lobster fisherman. And so he'd go out every day, and he'd try to catch as many lobsters as he could. And one time he goes out, and he has an abundant catch. He catches over 130 big Maine lobsters. And so he's just really, really excited, and he brings them home, and he stuffs all his freezers, and he's just so excited. It's the biggest catch he's ever had. And he thought, now I have enough lobster that I can eat lobster almost every day this year. And one of his friends comes over to, to admire his catch, you know, as friends do. <laughs> and he thought, well, you know, since you're here, won't you take one? And the guy was so excited that he gave him one of his lobsters that he just kind of filled the guy with his heart. He said, well, who else can I bless with one of, you know, some of my catch, some of the things that I have here? And so he started calling friends and was giving one lobster and two to some and three to another. And before he realized it, he got down and he only had three lobsters left. And he thought, well, you know, at one time I had enough to go almost the whole year and now I don't even have enough to get me through this week. But then he realized the joy he had had in giving, he didn't really care. But then a few days later, he came into his garage and he smelled a horrible smell. And he thought, what in the world is that? And he kind of followed the smell and he came to his freezer. And his freezer had stopped working in the night. And his lobsters had spoiled and smelled bad. And therefore, then for a moment, he kind of felt sorry for himself. thinking, I lost the last of my catch. But then he realized 
if I hadn't have given away what God had given me, it would have all been rotten. It would have all been corrupted. And Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, Do not store up treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let's, let's, let's store up treasure in heaven, being faithful in our tithes and our offerings, giving unto the Lord, not to a church, not to a denomination, not to a pastor, but to God himself. And let's give with all our heart. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much of all that you give us with. Again, you are a good father. And we thank you for what you've done in our life, how you provide. And we know the enormous blessings you give us are meant to be shared with others. That every time you give to us, it is meant to be passed on to someone else. When you give us grace, you mean us to give grace to others. When you give us knowledge, you mean us to teach others. And when you bless us financially, you want us to bless others. And as we give back to you the portion that belongs to you, and in addition to that, we pray that you will use it for your glory, for your purpose, and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. much for your giving. I also want to thank Lindsay for coming us and being with us while Brent's went on vacation. Wasn't that a treat? Yeah. She did so well. It's funny because, you know, it's you, when I know my, my work count is limited today and not for the same reasons it usually is, uh, but uh, I was trying not to sing, thinking if I lose my voice now, I'm in trouble. But uh, I do appreciate it when we can worship God because I, I think that's the thing. Sometimes even when you can't speak, your heart can glorify the Father in heaven. Uh, we just have one announcement, and that is VBS starts, uh, also the building fund, which I for completely forgot, but the VBS starts on, is that Monday or Tuesday? Sunday? Monday, all right. Hey, I don't, I don't plan these things. All right, so aren't you excited about VBS? All right, so make sure you tell everybody you know who is old enough to come and not too old to not, not come. Uh, but also, if you're going to volunteer, please be a part of that. Uh, this is just an opportunity, and I've shared this many times, but most people who accept the gospel of Jesus Christ hear it from the age of 4 to 14 years old. It is the most important age in order to hear the gospel of Christ. And there's going to be children coming in here. Maybe they've heard it before. Maybe they've never heard it at all. And we're going to get to plant seeds or to water seeds that are already there. And I'm believing that either now, next week, and when this takes place, or in the future, a harvest will come from these children. And who knows, maybe the next pastor of this church will come from one of those kids as they raise up and become what God wants them to be. So do be in prayer for that. I'd like for the children to come forward. Oh, oh yeah, it's the fifth Sunday. Never mind. Yeah. You can tell my mind's not working. Children, sit down. <laughs> Sorry, you was getting excited. All right. Okay, we're going to continue our uh, series on the Ten Commandments. And do please keep me in prayer. This is actually really, really hard. My uh, my mind, my head is full of <laughs> whatever it's full of when you got a cold, not thinking very clearly. And also the whole thing of General Assembly, I'm still processing that. People always want to ask me right when I get back, how was it? And I'm like, give me about a month, and then I'll tell you how it was. Uh, I do want you to be in prayer for our denomination as a whole. There were some significant decisions made, uh, and so just be in prayer. You can watch it if you want, but it is just something that uh, I believe that the Church of God as a, as a whole, we're, we're a little bit out of a crossroads about moving forward for the kingdom of God. 
There is a vision that has been laid forward as far as uh, the Great Commission and fulfilling the Great Commission. But, you know, that we have to realize that there is so much to be done in the kingdom. It is very, very easy to look around us and to think, well, this is good enough. And we can never, ever, ever get that way. We need to continue to push back the gates of hell for the kingdom, not only in the world, but also in our community and with, uh, in, within our own church family, that we need to be able to win people to Christ and share Jesus because that is the purpose of the church in order to fulfill his, fulfill his plan for our, for our existence. Now, uh, I've had a few people, as we, as we go into the day sermon, because the day sermon I was a little bit worried about, and that's why this week that has just went by, has, you know, because I didn't have a whole lot of time to study during general assembly, didn't have, really have time to do anything during general assembly, and then yesterday I slept about 20 hours, so it was a thing of I didn't get really the prep time in I wanted, but I've had several people ask me, when you preach these sermons, do you know something about me? Uh, there was one person that commented, <laughs> which I've never actually heard this in, in, in preaching, that I could see through her soul, okay? Uh, and all that means is that when I'm preaching, you think I'm talking about you directly when I'm not. You have to realize that I'm not, I'm not, the, I'm not a preacher who is putting my sermon together the week before I preach it. Uh, I mean, like next Sunday, I won't start preparing that sermon tomorrow. It's written already. I go back and I restudy it and I re-research it and all those kind of things. But these sermons I wrote over three years ago. So there's no possible way I'm preaching at you. If you feel that, it's simply God speaking to you through me, un unknowledgeable to me, in order to speak into your life. And we should receive the word of God and accept it. So I just want to say that, that I'm not looking into your soul. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure if I would want to. I'm just kidding. Yeah. But in the, in the previous sermons, we've talked about how the Ten Commandments are not a list of do's and don'ts, but a list of principles we should, that God wants us to live by in order for us to have a good relationship with Him and a good relationship with one another. So far, we've talked about the priority principle of God being first, purity about the influences in our life, humility before the name of God, rest and Sabbath, and then honor of our mother and father in our spiritual authority and other authorities in our life. But tonight, today, the principle we're going to talk about is love. And this is going to surprise you when, if you don't know what the sixth commandment is. In Exodus 20 and 13 says, you shall not murder. Okay? You shall not murder. Now, one thing I want to talk about a little bit here is the importance of the, the original languages. And I know you've probably been in church long enough to hear a pastor say, in the original text, or in the Greek, or in the Hebrew... And sometimes you probably just think we're trying to use our education or our knowledge to show off. That is not what it is about. There is an importance of learning the biblical languages. Now, I want to say this. For the average Christian, to go and get a degree in Greek or Hebrew is unnecessary. To be honest, for the average pastor, it is unnecessary. But it is important for all of us to understand that the Bible was not written originally in our language. It was, the English language did not exist, and that's why we have multiple translations. When you look at your Bible, it will say the NIV or the KGV or the NKGV. The version means translation. And that means it has been taken from one language and brought into another language. And that is difficult because Greek is a very, very deep, thorough language. It has great grammar. And English actually is a blending of languages and the grammar is not as specific. And so sometimes there are words in Greek that don't translate well into English. And we need to realize that. And so when we're looking at the Bible, we need to be careful not to get so upset when we see differences in various translations. Because all it is is that the translators of that text are trying to figure out what is the best word to use. Okay? And that's where we get to the whole thing of thou shalt not murder. Nowhere. In the Greek Bible, the Hebrew Bible, or the, what's called the Septuagint, which is the, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew Old Testament translated into Greek. Nowhere does it say, thou shalt not kill. Nowhere. Nowhere does it say that. You can look in the Greek, you can look in the Hebrew, you can look in the Septuagint. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not kill. It specifically says, every time the sixth commandment is quoted, it says, Thou shalt not murder. 
And I think I, I, on the next couple of slides, I have the next one. Just in case you don't believe me, all right? The next one, too. Those are the Hebrew words. And if you want to, you can look them up. It doesn't mean kill. It means murder. And in fact, if we read the Old Testament, we'd realize that Israel had capital punishment. Israel engaged in warfare directed by God. And these are not violations of the Sixth Commandment. These are not sins against God because God led them into these conflicts. God gave them these laws which brought about capital punishment. The, the, the commandment of God is thou shalt not murder. And I just wanted to bring that up so that when we're reading the Bible, because sometimes on Facebook, I'll see them compare two different translations and talk about ones of God and ones of the devil. No, it's just who translated the material, what they thought the word should be translated. But nowhere, nowhere should it ever be translated, thou shalt not kill. But why the principle of love? Why should I take thou shalt not murder and develop the, the principle of love from this? Because the Bible links murder to hate. It links those two things together. So what's the opposite of hate? Love. In John 3, 15, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Now think about that. If we have hate in our life, then we are equal in the biblical sense to a murderer. And no one with hate in our life, no one with has, who has hate for another person in their life can possibly have eternal life residing inside of them. Romans 3, 13, 9. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And what other, whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So in all these things that Jesus, I mean, that God was telling us to not do, ultimately he's telling us, don't do that, but love. And so the principle of thou shalt not murder that God's trying to teach us, don't hate one another, love one another. And see, again, it's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's just, oh, I don't want you to do this and I don't want you to do that. He's trying to get us to love each other. But, you know, I'm not really worried too much about someone in this church murdering someone else. Not too much. Every now and then, I hope no one's thinking about murdering anyone, especially me. Maybe after the sermon it might be different. But I am worried about people in our church letting things happen in their life that lead up to murder, such as hate, unforgiveness and the other things that people take and walk down a road they think they would never go no I don't think that people are going to let it get to the point of, of of murder but when the Bible says if you hate a brother or sister it is equal to murdering them we can't argue with that we cannot argue with the words of our Savior so what are four things that precede murder what are four things that lead up to murder number one is hate precedes murder in Genesis 37, 4 and 5, refer, this is referring to Joseph. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Verse 18, but when they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. So Joseph had these dreams, and these dreams come from God. Now, I don't know if I preached that sermon here yet, but eventually I will. I believe that Joseph handled this gift from God in a bad way. I believe that he was boasting a little bit because he was the younger brother, right? And I, I am the younger brother, and I know how much I enjoy antagonizing my older brother, right? And so if I had a dream that my brother was going to have to bow before him, you better bet he's going to hear that at the dinner table. You know, I had this dream, you bowed before me. And I kind of think that's the way Joseph kind of pitched his dream to his brothers. And then he has another dream in which his parents bow before him, and he tells them too. And I'm just thinking the way he told them probably couldn't have been all that good. But maybe not, but that's just the way I see it. But anyway, he tells his brothers this, and they get angry. And they just let it go in their mind. They get so, so angry, and then they see him, and this is our chance. This is our chance to kill him. In Deuteronomy 19, verse 11 and 12 but if out of hate someone lies in wait, 
assaults and kills a neighbor, and then flees to one of these cities, talking about cities of refuge, the killer shall be sent for by the town elders. He'd be brought back from the city and be handed over to the avenger of blood to die. So if you intentionally hated someone, you plotted and planned to kill them, we might call this premeditated murder, then the cities of refuge in the Bible were not for you. In Joshua 20 and 5, if the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must sur not surrender the fugitive because the fugitive killed their neighbor unintentionally and without malice or forethought. So if you, didn't, if you did it by accident, you didn't mean anything to happen, it just happened accidentally, then the cities of refuge would protect you. And in the Bible, malice equals hate. So it's a thing that if we hate one another, biblically, it is no different than if we killed them. Now let me just say this. That does not mean you're thinking, well, I hate someone. I might as well just go ahead and kill them. No, that's not what that means. It's just saying that is the attitude. That is the motivation of the heart. That is what's lying inside of you that makes it almost no different in the sight of a holy, pure God of what you're feeling towards someone else. But if hate precedes murder, what precedes hate? Anger. Anger precedes hate. You have never been, you, you have never hated anyone that you were not first angry with. The first murder in the Bible was because of anger. Cain got angry with Abel. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 and 5 and verse 8. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the first fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and, and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face downcast. Verse 8, now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Anger is an emotion. It is an emotion every one of us has had. It is an emotion that we have all experienced, but it does not mean that because we have this emotion, we have sinned. It doesn't mean that that emotion has become hate, okay? Because you can get angry and not sin. Ephesians 4, 26, in your anger, do not sin. That means we can become angry and not let it lead to hate, not let it lead to sinful practices and things. And the, and the thing that we have to get to realize is what affects our feelings, okay? We all have feelings, and we're going to get into this as we go through. But when you have a feeling, what gave you that feeling? Now, in America, they want us to believe that our feelings come first, but that is psychologically impossible. A thought is what gives you your feelings. You cannot have a feeling that has not been brought upon you other than through a thought. You think something, then you feel it. Let me give you an example. Fried chicken. Are you hungry? And that's why the Bible tells us to take our thoughts captive in obedience to Christ. Because when I have this thought that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mad at Dave. Dave, you know, his, his hair looks better than mine. <laughs> It sh his, his head shines brighter than mine, and it makes me, I mean, just whatever. You know, and you sit there, and, you, and I go home, and I just start thinking about it. Well, he did that on purpose, you know. I mean, because if you think about some of the things that we actually get angry about, think about them. Sometimes how small and insignificant they really, really are. How, but we sit there, and we dwell on them, and we think about them, and we think about them. And then that leads to a unrighteous choice. Because you are made up of thoughts, and you are made up of feelings, and we are made up of a spirit, will, heart. Our spirit, will, and heart, biblically, are the same thing, and that's where choice comes from. And we have the choice in what to think about. And so when we choose, we take that thought captive in obedience to Christ, and then we're told to think on lovely things, and good things, and pure things, and, and the things of God so we don't think about these evil things, we don't think about those things, then we can have, the feelings will begin to change. It's like in marriage. Too many people think that a loving action brings a loving feeling. No, it doesn't. First of all, you have to have a loving choice to do the loving action, to bring the loving feeling. 
Now, if you're just sitting around your living room waiting to feel love for your spouse, okay, and you've been married longer than six weeks, all right, and you're waiting to, and you're just sitting in your living room and you're waiting to feel love in order to show love to your spouse, it will never, ever happen. What you have to do is to choose, because love is a commitment, to choose to do an action of love to your spouse that will bring the feeling of love. It will all go in that way together. And hate is no different. If we sit there and dwell on it and dwell on it and dwell on it, we're going to get angrier and angrier and angrier. It's going to lead to actions of hatred or actions that we're going to lead to a sinful practice in our life. Thus, it's not anger that is a sin. It's what we do when we are angry. The choice we make when we feel angry. Do you know anybody with a bad temper? It's amazing how many spouses kind of looked at each other. Now, I'll be very honest. I've struggled with this for a long time. I mean, thankfully, God's brought me along. But when Carrie and I first met and I got angry, I'd be angry with you for two or three weeks. I wouldn't talk to you. I wouldn't do anything for two or three weeks. I mean, I'd just steam and I'd sit there and dwell on it. I don't know if it's just I got too old and realized God, I take too much energy to be angry. I'm not going to do that. But I'm hoping that God is sanctifying that in my life where I don't get angry so easy. I mean, sometimes in the church, it's amazing what we get angry about. <laughs> like shaking the pastor's hand. It's amazing that people get angry over the smallest things within the church. I mean, you've all heard stories of churches splitting over the color of the carpet, over small little things. I know a church that fired the pastor because he moved the piano eight feet. And what he told me, he says, I should have moved it just an inch every week and they'd have never noticed it. But we get angry about so many things that really, really don't matter, that really, really don't play into eternity or anything like that just because we sit there and we dwell on them over and over and over again. But a lot of times a person with bad temper, it's because they often have unresolved issues of anger in their life. And trying to find and deal with those unresolved issues in our life are very, very important. And God will help us with that. So hate precedes murder, anger precedes hate, what precedes anger, an offense. People get offended. And let's just be honest, in our country today, people are getting offended about everything. Uh, I was amazed at some of the things I heard when, even when I was at General Assembly that people were offended about. And I was thinking, okay, but we cannot allow ourselves to be so easily offended. And then what we'll do when we're offended, we dwell on that offense. And then we start questioning the motives of why they offended me. Cain was offended at God and he was offended at Abel. But Matthew 24, 10 says, at the time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Now, listen to that. That is Jesus saying this, that there's a time in coming, and I believe that time is now, in which people are going to get so angry with one another, they just turn away from God altogether. There's nothing in the world that's going to lead you into a backslidden state like resentment, anger, and unforgiveness. And the last time we talked about Jesus saying that a prophet is without honor except in his own country, in his own family. And people were often offended by Jesus in his hometown. In Mark chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many heard him were amazed. Now remember that word, because we're going to talk about that in a minute. Where did this man get these things, they asked, what this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of Jesus, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense with him. Now listen of why they took offense. He was teaching good. And he was healing people. And they were offended. But that word amazed is not what you think it means. Okay, this is where we got to be very, very careful with a translation and undertaking one word in developing doctrines out of it. Because this word amaze does not mean what we think it means. Here it means to strike out at someone, to drive them away. That you're amazed in the sense that you're angry with them and that you want to drive them out. 
They were angry because they thought Jesus was just a carpenter and he was showing them up. And they had offended them. They offended them that this poor, insignificant carpenter could actually come in here and teach me a thing or two. That he could actually come in here and be used by God. And I think sometimes in the church, we're no different. We think you have to have a big name to be used by God. We think you have to be recognized by the denomination or the state to be used by God. When God can use any person he wants to use at any time he wants to use them. And I hope that sometimes we just don't get offended when God uses someone else more than me. I pray that we become a church where we use so much that we constantly stand in the amazement of God of how he is using our brothers and sisters more than he is us. But people get jealous. People get jealous and envious about that and they get offended that this person is being used more than me. Who is using them? God Almighty. Then praise be to God. Praise be to God if God can use you more than he can me or anyone else. But they were, they, they, they were amazed at Jesus in a way that it angered them. They were offended. They were envious and jealous. The same Greek word is used when Jesus is reading about the Messiah in Luke chapter 4. When he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the tenant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened onto him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him over the brow of the hill in which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. They were so offended, they wanted to kill him. How many times do we let our offenses go too far? How many times do we let things drive us away from the presence of God because we are offended? Hate precedes murder. And you may never murder someone, but you, if you hate someone, the Bible draws an equivalent to that. Anger precedes hate. Offense precedes anger. We have to realize how the devil is not just going to suddenly plant in your head to do something horrible. He's first going to start by just an offense. That brother offended you. You really, really should be angry. How dare they say that to you? How dare they look at you that way? How dare they not shake your hand? (laughs) I'm never going to let you live that down, ever. But what creates offenses? Okay, now we all get offended. Let's just let's just be honest and let's just be real. And our culture now is teaching us to be offended about everything. Okay, but we all do get offended every now and then. Why? Because we're prideful, sinful creatures. Right? That's why we get offended. Because let's just be honest. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we have no right to be offended. No matter what someone says to us, no matter what someone does to us, in the eyes of God, as someone who has followed, been, been saved by Jesus Christ, I don't have the right to be offended, okay? But we do. We get offended. What brings that on? Unfulfilled expectations. The next slide. Unfulfilled expectations create offense. In Luke 7, John, uh, John's disciples told him all, that all these things calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come? This is John the Baptist. Or should we expect someone else? When the men came to to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come, or should we accept someone else? Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about John the Baptist? He's in prison. Okay, He was arrested for preaching about Jesus. He's in prison, and he is the one who asked this question. John the Baptist the one who was, told, who was foretold to come and proclaim the way of the Lord. The, forest, the, you know, the predecessor to the Messiah. 
John the Baptist, who, who was there and saw Jesus at the beginning of his ministry and heard, and he actually said with his own voice, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist is the one who baptized Jesus and said, You should baptize me, and I'm not even worthy to unlace your sandals. John the Baptist, who heard God say when he baptized Jesus, Behold my son in whom I am well pleased. Over and over and over again, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus as the one, the Messiah, the Son of God. But here he's asking, are you really the one? What happened? What happened to John the Baptist that he was proclaiming Jesus pretty much all of his life, and now he's in prison and he's asking, are you really the one? And think of this, John was in prison And Jesus was in the same city. And Jesus doesn't even answer the question right away. He just goes on healing people. Luke 7. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. Look at verse 23. And I do believe this is directed towards John. Blessed is anyone who is not offended on account of me. John was in prison for proclaiming the name of Jesus, proclaiming that Jesus is the one. Again, Jesus is in the same city. And as far as we know, Jesus never visited John in prison. Let me think about that for a minute. You ever get offended because someone don't visit you? It's always amazing when I can only hear the air conditioner. (laughs) Jesus did not go visit his friend who proclaimed he is the one, the one who baptized him. He didn't go visit him in prison. And let me say, in that time, you could visit prisoners. Jesus does not perform a miracle. And release John. We don't see what happened to Paul and Silas where the earth shaked, the door is open. We don't see any of that. Jesus didn't do that for John. And perhaps, just perhaps, John was offended. Perhaps he expected Jesus to do something miraculous for him. And he was offended because of unfulfilled expectations. How many times are we offended by God because he doesn't do the things that we think he should do? How many times are we offended by God because we, he doesn't do things the way we think he, we sh- he should do them? How many times are we offended by each other because we don't do the things that we're expected to do or we think we should do? We have an expectation of a friend, a family member, a colleague, a church member, a board member, a pastor that goes, un- goes unfulfilled and we get offended. Wives get offended at their husbands. Husbands get offended at their wives because of unfulfilled expectations. The church, full of people who are offended because the church can never fulfill all their unfulfilled expectations. And again, most offenses are over insignificant acts and insignificant behavior. Think about marriage. And I think you can really parallel marriage with a lot of things in the church. How many times do husband and wife get angry with one another Simply out of unfulfilled expectations. And I think, you know, sometimes we, we're, we're, we're to blame. I mean, because we watch all this stuff on Hollywood and, you know, rainbows and unicorns and all that kind of stuff. And we expect marriage to actually be that way. We expect it to be like what we've seen on TV and the movies. And, you know, uh, when most of the time marriage, I mean, I've always saw like real love is holding your spouse's head above the toilet so they don't fall in when they're sick, you know. But we, we have all these unfulfilled expectations of our spouse, of one another in the church, and we never can fulfill them, and that's where offense comes from. The biblical definition of the Greek word for offense, we're going to talk about that. A stumbling stone is actually what it means, an offense. Something that makes you stumble. Now think about that. So when you're offended, you have stumbled. It is the same word 
from the Greek word, we get the word scandal in English. It is the Greek word scandalon. And it is the word that is used for the little stick that you use to set a trap for an animal. Okay? Now, I know you've all watched probably enough Bugs Bunny that you've seen them do this. Where they stick that in there, the, the dumb animal goes in there, and it falls down on them. Well, I'll tell you this. Biblically, the box was set by Satan. But you know who gives Satan the stick? We do. We give him the stick that he uses to trap us in our offense. Because we say, Satan, if they do this to me, I will be offended. And so he takes that, he sets a trap and just waits for someone to fulfill that in your life, to give you that little bit of bait to go in and fall into his trap. Satan sets the trap. It's a little offense. And you and I get trapped in it every single time. And that's the sad thing, is that we give him the little stick that he uses to trap us. We give him the stick, the stick that he's using to destroy our relationship with God and destroy our relationship with one another because we allow ourselves to become offended. There is a person who is actually calling, called a stumbling stone and a rock of offense in the Bible. Do you know who that person is? Don't answer if you don't be really sure. Jesus. He's called the rock of offense. Romans 9, 33. As it is written, see I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. The one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Jesus will either offend you or be your foundation. One or the other. Why are we surprised in our country today that people pick, choose Christianity to attack? You know, we're the ones that they point at when we say that we're inclusive, that only, only Jesus is the way to heaven. We are the ones they point at when Islam, Hinduism, and uh, Judaism all believe exactly the same thing, that they are the way. Okay? But we're the one they point at. In so many things, they, they want to point out Christianity as offensive, as biased, as big, you know, big, b- involved in, in discrimination. Jesus told us they're going to be offended by him. Why does it surprise us? Why do we think that everyone should just love us and accept us and not be offended when we stand in pulpits and churches over righteousness and holiness in our country? When we hold up this book, how do we think they're not going to be offended when Jesus says, I will be in a stumbling block to them? But we cannot use this book ever to justify being offended. Some of the places that Carrie and I have got to serve, you know, we've dealt with the world's religions and we've dealt with them. Most of the time it's been very pleasant. But every now and then you get someone who wants to attack Christianity. I have a choice. Do I let that offend me, brush them aside and not present them the gospel? Or do I endure it for the cause of Christ and wait patiently, allowing them to see the love of Jesus in me so that I can share the gospel with them? Again, Jesus will offend you or he will be your foundation. When people offend you, they will place a rock in front of you, but not the same one. But whether you stumble over an offense, whether you get trapped in Satan's snare is your choice. It is your choice. And then when people are offended or when they stumble over a rock, (laughs) not Jesus, but other rocks, They like to pick them up and carry them around for the rest of their life. I don't know how many people I have heard share with me things that offended them 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that they're still carrying around with them. Hate precedes murder. Anger precedes hate. An offense precedes anger. And unfilled expectations precede an offense. But what about love? That's our principle here today. What precedes love? And I'm going to give you two things that lead to love. 
Now, again, I want to remind you how we're made up as human beings. We, we have a soul, and our soul is compassed with our feelings, our thoughts, our will, our heart, our spirit. That's all the same thing. Our social environment where God has placed us in our human body. But how we get to where we are when we're offended is that we ha- something happens. Someone says something. Someone does something, and we just start thinking about it. And that thought develops that feeling inside of us that resentment, that anger, and before long, we make a choice of will to do something we know we should not do. And that is exactly the way Satan wants us to work. He wants us to be dictated by our feelings. But God wants us to be dictated by our will, by our spirit, by our heart, where we say, Satan, yes, what they did offended me, but I'm going to choose to not let it bother me. I'm going to choose out of the choice of my will to not think about it. I'm going to take my thoughts captive in obedience to Christ. I'm going to think about good things, holy things, righteous things, lovely things. I'm going to think about the things of God, and I will not be caught in your snare, devil. I will walk in freedom of life and in Christ. What produces love? love? Forgiveness. It's what we preach to the world, but we don't practice in the church at all. Forgiveness. Matthew 5, 43 and 44. For you have heard it said, you have heard it that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Have you ever done that? It's hard. It's hard. You say, how do we love those who hate us? How do we pray for our enemies? Forgiveness. It is the only way. If you cannot forgive, you cannot possibly pray for those who hate you and who have persecuted you. It's why I tell married couples all the time, if you want your, you want your marriage to, to work, you've got to pray for each other. Because you can't pray for your spouse if you're angry with her and you hate her and you're holding resentment against her. Pray for her. I mean, just at, don't answer out loud. Ask yourself that question. How often do you really pray for your spouse? How hate leads to murder and how forgiveness leads to love are very, can be fulfilled in the same story in the Bible. The story of Jacob and Esau. Now, if you don't know this story, it's in Genesis uh, chapter 27. And you, you can read, just read the whole book of Genesis. But in this one story, you see how hate can lead to murder and how forgiveness can lead to love. In Genesis twenty-seven forty-one, Esau held a grudge against Jacob. How do you hold a grudge? You think about it. Because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So he's like, okay, first of all, I'm going to go to my dad's funeral, and then I'm going to prepare one for my brother. But then years later, in Genesis chapter 31, I mean 33, I'm sorry, it says Jacob looked up, and there was Esau. And Jacob was really afraid of Esau, by the way. Coming with his 400 men. But Esau ran to to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. How did Esau go from hating his brother and wanting to kill him to loving him and embracing him in that way? He forgave him. Again, it's the only way. He chose to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice of our will. It is how we choose to think of that person, how we have choose to think of that event in our life, how we choose to think determines how we feel. You say, but how can I forgive? You don't know what they've done to me. How can I let myself be brought to that point to forgive? Well, forgiveness precedes love. What precedes forgiveness? Grace. Grace precedes forgiveness. If you don't understand grace, then you can't forgive. 
But if you understand grace, if you truly have a biblical understanding of the word grace, if you understand what that word means, you can forgive anyone from doing anything. The overseer of the United Arab Emirates that I worked under and I worked with for almost 20 years, he had a daughter. And his daughter wanted to come to America to study medicine. But it was cheaper for her to go to India and study medicine. So she went to India. While she was there, she was kidnapped, raped, and murdered. Her body to this day has never, ever been found. The murderer confessed. He killed about 20 women. He confessed it. But he, didn't, he can't remember. He, had, he killed so many he couldn't remember where he actually buried her. The, stay over, the overseer of the UAE, he went to India, he went to the prison, he looked that man in the face and he said, I forgive you. How do you do that if you don't understand grace? How do you do that? But how do you give grace? If you have never received grace, you cannot give it. If you have never received the grace that only comes from Jesus Christ, it is not possible, possible to pass it along. We're not talking about something human. We're talking about something that is divine. If you struggle for give, giving forgiveness, it is likely you struggle from receiving forgiveness. If you struggle passing along grace, it's probably because you are struggling with receiving grace. If you do not see your salvation in relationship with Jesus Christ as an unimaginable act of forgiveness and grace, how in, the Lord, how in the world will you ever pass that along to someone else? Do you realize what he done when he went to the cross for you and I? You didn't deserve it. I don't care what you look like today. I mean, you may have been a Christian 40 years, and now you kind of look respectable. Now you might have your shirt buttoned up a little higher. And, you know, you, you might have your life a little bit more together. Maybe you don't do the things you used to do, but you still don't deserve it. There is nothing that we can do. There is nothing that we can sing. There is nothing that we can say that will ever make us worthy of the grace that Jesus Christ gave us. And when we don't realize what happened on that cross, and we don't realize the grace that was poured out into our life, then we will not possibly pass it on to another person. I was evil. Evil. I just soon cut your throat as look at you. I lived in a bottle. Did every drug that I could possibly find. Worship the devil. Would cut my, my, my wrist and my arms to make blood packs with Satan. I would fight anyone for 10 bucks. Not because I needed the money. Evil. I hated my parents. I hated everybody else. And mostly I hated myself. When I came to forgiving, I could forgive other people pretty easily. Forgiving myself was pretty hard. But one day, I met a man named Jesus. I'd heard about him a lot before. I'd heard about him you know, my, as a kid, and I'd heard about him when I was you know, an early teenager. But one day, I really, really experienced him. And that grace that only he can give poured into my life. And I went from a person of darkness to a person of light in a microsecond. I went from lost to found. Not because I was worthy. Not because I had changed. He didn't accept me because he, he, of something I had done that I stepped forward and said, I'll volunteer. I'll go wherever you want to go all I can say to him is Jesus I'm sorry I'm sorry for everything I've ever did and he wiped the slate clean he forgave me I don't deserve it I don't earn it I earn I have deserved every fire that hell ever can offer every torment that can ever come my way every bit of pain and suffering I will ever experience I earned all of that I did not earn his grace and because of the grace of Almighty God, I can stand here and say, I am forgiven. And that gives me no right, none at all, to not pass that forgiveness on to someone else. I don't forgive 
I don't forgive because I'm good. I forgive because I am forgiven. And I have no right to not forgive. There's been things done to me in my life that are horrible. It's all right. Doesn't equal nothing to what I did to him. I took the arms of the Son of God and I nailed them to a tree. I took the feet of the Son of God and I nailed them to the tree. I beat him with the cat of nine tails. I spit at him and mocked at him. And he looked down from heaven and he said, you are my child. Matthew 10, 8 says, freely you've received, freely give. None of us deserve this. But so many of us walk around like we've earned it. So many of us treat other people like we've earned it. And we don't. If you think you have to earn forgiveness from God, you will try to make others earn it from you. But once you truly accept and understand grace, and that you could not possibly deserve God's forgiveness... You won't make others earn it either. Do you know what the Greek word for forgiveness actually means? It means a release. That you release them. You know, we talk about redemption, that we were slaves to sin, and Jesus released us. He made us free. God released you and I from the day of judgment. He released you and I from the trap of the devil. But forgiveness is not only spoken, it is also displayed. And if we play the offense over and over and over again in our mind, our thoughts will come in captive to that offense, to the devil, and not to Christ. And you say, but you don't realize what they've done to me. You don't realize it. That person was wrong. Of course they're wrong. You don't forgive someone who's right. I mean, how many times? They're perfectly right, but I just need to forgive them. Maybe the preachers. That's definitely a water drinking moment, Ronnie. You don't have to forgive people who are right. You don't have to forgive people who are good to you and nice to you. You've got to forgive people who hurt you. Again, I'm not concerned that the people in our church are going to murder someone. Not totally. (laughs) But I am afraid, terribly afraid, that some of us will fall into the trap of the devil and hold, or do hold, unforgiveness in our heart. That we'll be offended, that we'll be anger, and that we'll let hate to enter into our soul. And sooner or later... You may never actually physically murder someone. But see, that's the thing about unforgiveness. When unforgiveness finds its roots into a person's soul, someone's going to die. Rarely is it the person you're offended by. Because it will be you. When you do not forgive, the only person you are putting in prison, the only person you're going to hurt is yourself. Because that's going to come into bitterness and resentment and anger. And those roots are going to come into your life and choke God out of you. So this morning, as we always do, I want to ask, what is God saying to you? I'd like for you to stand. Now, of course, being sick, I'm not going to try to come down and pray for anyone I do have faith, yes I do, but I also have common sense. You don't need me to touch you for God to do anything in your life. God can do whatever he wants, however he wants. But I'd like for you to pray. Because before we get to those who are in Christ, I must address those who are not. If you're here today, and you are not a member of the family of God. You're not a Christian. You have never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or you have and you have walked away. 